Continuing a sermon series we began about a month ago now, entitled Flourishing, where we are exploring together what it means to enter into a fully alive, flourishing life as a citizen of God's kingdom, but a citizen of God's kingdom in a fallen, broken world. We suggested at the beginning of this series that every single person alive Christian, non-Christian desires to be happy, and not happy just for a moment, but to have their life marked by happiness. But we are exploring Jesus and his blueprint within the Sermon on the Mount of what it means to live a life as a disciple, and then specifically in Jesus' teaching in the Beatitudes, where we suggested God is giving us a description, a description of what a flourishing life looks like. And so today we're continuing that, our reading, Matthew 5, verses 1 through 10, which is the opening of Jesus' sermon, which is his Beatitudes, and has been our practice over these last weeks. I will read the first two verses of Matthew 5, and together we'll read the remaining eight. So I invite you to stand in honor of God's Word to read Matthew 5. I'll read the first two, and then together we'll read the remaining eight. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and he sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. And he said together, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And though the grass withers and the flower fades, The word of our Lord remains forever. Please be seated. Let's pray together. (coughs) Heavenly Father, we thank you that you sent your Son, Jesus, as a propitiation for our sins. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you inspired these writers to write these words for our good. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you be present with us to teach us, to comfort us, to conform us into the image of Jesus to bear witness to him. We pray, Holy Spirit, that we would not be like the foolish man, the foolish man who hears the words of Jesus and does not do them. That is a man who builds his house upon the sand. But, Holy Spirit, that by your empowerment, you would make us wise men and women, people who hear the words of Jesus and do them. For in so doing, we are like a person who builds their house upon the solid rock. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we are still walking our way through the Beatitudes, beginning three weeks ago now, uh, with the first of those, Jesus' teaching, where he said, Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And we suggested that uh, the big idea that Jesus is teaching is flourishing, which is what our uh, sermons are about, is flourishing is living in total dependence upon God. That when Jesus uses the word for poor, he uses the lowest level of poor, saying blessed is the beggar. That every day is living in total dependence upon the Lord. Then the next week we look, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted, saying that flourishing there is having a heart that is sensitive to sin. That when our hearts are sensitive to sin, we are led to confess our sins and to seek repentance, and we receive the comfort of forgiveness and cleansing. 
And then last week we looked at, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, saying there that to be meek or the blessing of meekness there flourishing is entrusting your life to God, that we entrust all of ourselves into the hands of Jesus. This week we are looking at, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled or satisfied, depending on your translation. So the big idea today, if I hope that what you walk away with from this message this morning is this thought, that flourishing is craving wholehearted devotion. That if you're like me, that if I go without eating or drinking for over six to eight hours, my body begins to crave something to eat. My body begins to ache for something to drink. And what Jesus is teaching us is that a flourishing life as a citizen of God's kingdom in a broken world looks like a person who craves and aches after righteousness. As we'll see as we walk through this morning, we can define in Jesus' teaching as wholehearted, all of our hearts devoted to the Lord. And I think we also get a bit of a picture here of how Jesus would suggest we enter into this kind of life. Because it's one thing to say, hey, flourishing is being wholeheartedly devoted. Well, well, how do I do that? I think Jesus gives us a clue in the structure of his beatitude. Because what he says is, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. But I think we are very used to just reading this over and over again. And so we kind of take for granted the order with which Jesus speaks these words. We opened up our message today saying that all people seek to be happy, that all people want to flourish and be joyful. But what Jesus doesn't say is blessed are those who hunger and thirst for flourishing. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for fullness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for satisfaction. Maybe that seems counterintuitive. That if what we all want is to be happy, well, shouldn't that be what we hunger and thirst for? But what Jesus is saying is that those who are flourishing, that those who are satisfied and live a full life are not those who hunger and thirst for it. That's what those who live that kind of life are hungering and thirsting for something else. And what they're hungering and thirsting after is a wholehearted devotion to the Lord Jesus. And when we hunger and thirst for that, we receive a flourishing life. But I think that if we kind of take Jesus' words and turn them on their head, we can infer a woe. Now remember, woe is the opposite of a blessing. So if we say, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be full or they shall be satisfied, we might pronounce a woe that turns this on its head to say that woe to those who hunger and thirst for satisfaction. Woe to those who hunger and thirst for flourishing first and foremost, for they shall be empty. There is a way of life, there is a path that you and I can walk down that the end of the path takes us towards a destination of emptiness. There is another path that we can walk down that leads us towards a destination of flourishing and fullness. And I hope that this morning we can see the difference between the two, and I hope that we can together, empowered by the Holy Spirit, be firmly walking down the straight and narrow path towards fullness in Christ. So first we wanna say, what do we mean that there is a life that leads towards emptiness? That there is a way of living, the destination of which we are headed is to be empty. And that Jesus is teaching that in this beatitude, but this is a consistent message through the scriptures. I want to invite you into the Old Testament to see this testified there in the book of 1 Samuel. So this is in this case, 1 Samuel 12. And as you turn there, if you would actually please turn to 1 Samuel 8. 8, 1 Samuel 8 gives us the context to understand Samuel's words in 1 Samuel 12. So 1 Samuel 8. Now 
Now, in 1 Samuel 8, the people of Israel, the elders of the people of Israel, are gathered together to talk to Samuel. Samuel is the last of Israel's judges. He is a righteous man and universally recognized and respected by the people of Israel. So no one's walking around questioning Samuel. He is a righteous man. Now Samuel is getting old, and Samuel recognized that, recognizes that himself. And so seeing that he is getting old, Samuel appoints his two sons to be judges after him. And so the people of Israel are coming to Samuel to address that. Because the issue is, that Samuel is a righteous man, universally respected, but Samuel's sons are not. His sons are not universally recognized as being righteous, and people are not respecting them in their character, and that's the problem. So they say in verse four, the elders gather together, and they come to Samuel, and they say this, you are old, and your sons do not follow your ways. So we have a problem. We recognize you're getting old. We need to look past you to see what's coming. But your plan of appointing your sons we don't think is a good one because we don't see your character in your sons. So the people say, so we have a plan of our own. Samuel, we want to tell you what we think you should do. And so what they tell him is this. Therefore, because of that, because you're old and your sons are not following in your ways, appoint a king to lead us. We want a king. Now, even that request in and of itself perhaps really wasn't the most sinful thing. Uh, Even in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses provides instructions for Israel's kings. So even there, there's this idea that maybe there'll be a kingship in the future. So the issue here isn't necessarily, but perhaps somewhat, the request for a king. But I think what is really at issue here is the motivation and the heart attitude of why they want a king. And they tell Samuel why they want a king. We want a king, why or for what reason? We want a king such as all the other nations have. We wanna be like them, we wanna be like the nations. We, we, Samuel, we're looking around at the other nations and we want to be like them. And if we're going to be like them, then we need to start practicing their ways. And if we're gonna start practicing their ways, one of the things that we recognize as being very important is to have a king. Now Samuel's upset. And in verse seven, God tells Samuel, look Samuel, you're taking this personally, but don't. Don't take it personally. They're not rejecting you. Who are they rejecting? They're saying they're rejecting me. So there's something about the Israelites' request to be like the nations that God says that in that request, what they are doing is rejecting me. And that's important for you and I to hear. When you and I are motivated to be like the nations, when we look around and we see everyone else seems to be doing very well, and we think, you know, I want to be doing well like them. So I need to start practicing their ways so I can do well like them. We are, maybe you're not saying it on your lips, but with your actions, you are rejecting God. And so God goes to Samuel and he says, okay, Samuel, they want a king like the nations. Tell them what they're gonna get. You're gonna get a king like the nations. And what does a king of the nations do? Well, Samuel tells them. Here's what the king of the nations will do. He's gonna take your sons away from you and he's going to conscript them into his military. He's going to take your daughters away from you. Their daughters are going to be his perfumers, his cooks and his bakers. He will take the best of your fields from you, verse 14. He'll take your olive groves. He will take a tenth of your grain and your vintage. He's gonna give it away to his officials. He will take your servants. He'll take the best of your cattle. He'll take your donkeys. He'll take those for his own youth. He's gonna take a tenth of your flocks. And in verse 17, probably the worst, is he's gonna take all of you to be what? His slaves. Does this sound very good? 
But the people don't listen. They say, we don't care. We want to be like the nations. And whenever you want to be like the nations, it will cost you. But they refuse to listen and they tell Samuel, no, they say, we want a king over us. Why, verse 20, then we will be like all the other nations. Then we'll have a king. And that king will lead us and go out before us and fight our battles. Because a king, now a king in the ancient Near East did many things, but two of the primary things that a king was tasked with doing for the nation that he was in authority over was to provide security and prosperity. And the people were looking around going, we're seeing some nations like Egypt and Syria and Assyria. We see these other nations and we see them prospering. They seem to be very secure. They seem to be very prosperous and we want to be like them. And so we need a king who's going to provide that. Because a king, again, would provide security through military and a king would provide prosperity, particularly through political alliances with other countries, other nations. And finally, Saul, Samuel says, fine, give him a king. And so that began the kingship, and then Saul is anointed king. But the king was primarily tasked with those two things. We see we, we, the nations around us are flourishing. They're flourishing. And we want to flourish like them. And did the, this is interesting, but did the kings do this? I mean, as an example, uh, the kings of, of Israel. In the northern kingdom, uh, which was split, after Saul, uh, sorry, Solomon's death, how many good kings were there in the northern kingdom? Zero, zero. Good kings in the eyes of the Lord. Zero righteous kings. But did the kings of the north, now it's a bit mixed, but in general, did the kings of the north provide prosperity and security for them? Did the kings of the north in general provide security and prosperity for the northern kingdom? Yes. It was interesting because in the last verse, was like, no. I said, actually, yeah. They did. They did what kings are supposed to do. Kings are supposed to provide security. Kings are supposed to provide prosperity. And the kings of the northern kingdom did. Was God pleased? He was not. Because they were like a king like the nations. That says a lot for you and me. I think. So let's turn to 1 Samuel 12 now. Now, 1 Samuel 12 is Samuel's farewell address to the people. And, so, and Samuel's going to get to the heart of the issue, no pun intended. So in the opening here, in verse 20, Samuel starts by saying, do not be afraid. And the reason why he opens up here with those words is because he had just confronted the people of Israel with their sin in requesting a king and had given them a sign from the Lord that God was displeased with them. And but he follows that up by saying, do not be afraid. And he goes on and he calls the people back to devotion to the Lord. And he says, you have done all this evil, yet do not turn away from the Lord. But serve the Lord with what? All your heart. The issue here is the heart of the people. When we desire to be like the nations, what we're saying is, my heart doesn't belong to God. My heart is now belonging someplace else. I've given my heart away, so I desire to be like the nations. But God is, Samuel is saying, return to the Lord, serve the Lord, be wholeheartedly devoted to him. He says in verse 21, do not turn away after useless idols. They can do you no good, nor can they rescue you. All that flourishing you see in the nations around you and you want to be like them, what good is it going to do you ultimately? None. You and I, every one of us, are at some point going to stand before the Lord and we're going to have to give an account of our life. Now, I think that accounting for the Christian who has faith in Christ will look different for the Christian or the non-Christian who has no faith in Christ. But I do think, and I think the scriptures teach, we will be judged. Now, when we stand before the Lord and we have to give an account of our life, Jesus saying every idle word, 
Are we able to stand up there and go, yes, I know, yeah, but I'm a CEO. Is that going to rescue you at that time? Yeah, but I had a very fast sports car. I have a three-story house on a lake. Now, are those things bad? But are they going to rescue you? Do you put your heart in them? Do you trust in those things? They're useless, he says. They can do you no good because they are useless. And the Hebrew word there means empty. They're empty. There is a pathway that leads towards emptiness. And if you want to be like the nations, if you want to give your heart someplace else, and to seek and to hunger and thirst after flourishing like the nations, you can, but you will be empty. And he says in verse 24, be sure to fear the Lord and to serve him faithfully with your whole heart. Consider the great things God has done for you, but if you persist in doing evil, both you and your king will perish. So let's now turn to the Sermon on the Mount to see, is this what Jesus teaches us there? So I invite you to open to Matthew 6. We want to keep in mind, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. So that's the important word we're looking for, righteousness, as wholehearted devotion. And he says here in verse 1 of Matthew 6, be careful. I'm warning you, do not practice your righteousness. There's that word, hunger and thirsting after righteousness. Do not practice your righteousness. Righteousness is something that we do. Don't practice it in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. If you have no reward from your Father in heaven for that which you do, ultimately what good is it? None. None. It's like having all the flourishing of the nations. You can have everything in the world, and if you get it, you have to forfeit your soul. Is it worth it? Only the reward from your Father ultimately has value. And so he gives examples of what what he means. What What do you mean, Jesus? What do you mean practicing our righteousness in front of others? He says, well, here's what I mean. When you give to the poor, now is giving to the poor good? Is giving to the poor righteous? Yes. But when you do your righteousness, don't announce it with trumpets. Don't announce it in the synagogues and on the streets. Why do they do that? Why, when you give to the needy and you announce it with a trumpet, why do you do that? He tells us, here's why they do that. They do that to be honored by others. If your heart is given over to hunger and thirst to receive honor from other people, are you wholeheartedly devoted to God? You are not. And if you are not wholeheartedly devoted to God, are you righteous in His sight? No. So here's an interesting point. Can you do righteousness and not be righteous? Yes. In the eyes of God. Now you're righteous in the eyes of men, but we just said, does that ultimately count for anything? No. Same thing with prayer. If you pray, don't stand in the streets, in the synagogues, praying long prayers on the street corners. Why do they do that? It says right here, to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they've already received their reward. But do they receive any reward from their Father in heaven? No. Is it any good? Not ultimately. There's a flourishing that looks like a flourishing here and now, and there's a flourishing that has an eternal perspective. And same thing with fasting. Don't disfigure your face when you fast. And why do you disfigure your face? So people will see you, and they'll honor you. This is a flourishing like the nations. You know what flourishing is to this type of person? Flourishing is everybody thinking that you're a great person. Flourishing is the honor from men. Flourishing is sitting at the head of the table. Flourishing is having everybody stand when you walk into the room because of how great you are. But that what that demonstrates is your heart doesn't belong to the Lord. Your heart belongs somewhere else, and that is the central issue. Where does your heart belong? Does it belong to God or someplace else? And what does Jesus pronounce on this kind of life? He tells us in Matthew 23, 
Matthew 23 is Jesus' verdict on this kind of life. A life whose heart does not belong to the Lord, who seeks to flourish apart from God, who hungers and thirsts to be like the nations. These are Jesus' woes that he pronounces upon the Pharisees and teachers of the law. And here in verse 25, he says, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside in your heart, you are full of greed and self-indulgence. You're blind. First clean the inside of the cup, then the outside will also be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law, and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you are like whitewashed tombs. You, this is interesting, you look beautiful. You look beautiful. Are there people that you and I can imagine, or maybe even yourself or someone you know that looks beautiful on the outside. Everything seems great. There are people that every single time they're, they're there, they're, they're, they're doing everything they're supposed to do. They look beautiful. And Jesus says, you look beautiful. But only on the outside. On the inside, you're dead. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as Righteous, but it's not righteous. But on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. And what we might be saying that what Jesus is teaching is that there is a way of life we might call a kind of man-made religion, just religiosity, that is only concerned with the outside. We might say that religion is concerned about behavior modification. So if you drink, stop doing that. If you smoke, stop smoking. If you watch rated R movies, stop doing that. If you uh, dance and play cards, stop. Is that Christianity? Is that what it means to follow Jesus? Well, if you drink, just stop drinking. Is that what it means to follow Jesus? What Jesus is concerned, now is Jesus concerned with behavior? Of course he is, but that's not what he's primarily concerned about. And that's not what, how you and I are gonna be judged. But at the end, what Jesus is concerned about is heart transformation. Jesus is looking at the inside and going, this is what I care about. All you care about, Pharisees and teachers of the law, is the outside. You make yourself look beautiful, and you are. Congratulations, you received your reward in full but you will be left empty because what Jesus cares about is your heart. Where does your heart belong this morning? Does your heart belong to the Lord? Do you crave, do you ache to be wholeheartedly devoted to the Lord Jesus? Or are you seeking to flourish like the nations? Because that way leads towards emptiness. But Jesus is inviting us down a path of transformation by his Holy Spirit that leads to fullness a life that overflows, a life where Jesus says, take this cup and drink it and it will well up to eternal life. And what do we know and see what Jesus teaches about that? What does that mean? I think he begins to tell us in Matthew 5, back to the Sermon on the Mount. What does he mean? What is this wholehearted devotion? A very pivotal verse for understanding the Sermon on the Mount, I would suggest, is this verse. He says in verse 20 of chapter 5, I tell you that unless your righteousness, there's our word, right? Unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, if you imagine being uh, at the Sermon on the Mount on the original day that it was preached, and Jesus is saying that, and you hear him say that, I don't know about you, but I think I start getting a little worried. What do you mean my righteousness needs to exceed theirs? How could I do that? How could my righteousness exceed the Pharisees? These are the most righteous people alive. They live by the letter of the law. They were scrupulous. They would tithe, and even the little plants they pulled up from the ground when they were doing their 
uh, gardening. They would tent of their, uh, a tenth of their dill and their cumin and their mint. Imagine that. When you go outside and you pull carrots, you cut off 10% and give it away to the church. You can do that, I guess. Be a lot of carrots, I guess. But. That's how scrupulous they were. So the people listening goes, how am I supposed to do that? How can I be more righteous than them? That's impossible. Well, Jesus tells us how. He says, you've misunderstood because they're only concerned with the outside but I'm concerned with the heart. So is it enough simply not to murder? That's just the outside. Yeah, it's good not to murder, isn't it? Yes. Right? Is that Jesus is all, is that all Jesus is concerned about? Just don't murder. No, because what Jesus is saying, what I'm asking of you is wholehearted, total devotion. And if you're going to be wholeheartedly devoted to me, that means not simply this outside conformity through behavior modification. What it means is, is that to be wholeheartedly devoted is you don't even get angry because your heartbeat beats after my heartbeat. Because what I care about is your heart. And can you do that on your own, by the way? Is your own strength and your flesh going to transform your own heart? No, it comes by dependence on God and the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who transforms your heart, and you submit to the Holy Spirit, which means you have to give up your life, and when you give up your life, you receive it. And he goes on, he says, well, yeah, how about adultery? Is it enough simply not to consummate another relationship with another person in order not to be an adulterer? Is that enough? Now, if you're only concerned with the righteousness of the Pharisees, yeah, that's enough. Because the Pharisees were only concerned with behavior modification and what was on the outside. But Jesus says, no, that if you are going to be righteous before me, it's not enough simply not to consummate a relationship with someone else in order to have fidelity within the covenant of marriage, that you actually must not even lust in your heart by looking at another person lustfully. Because what God is concerned is not your outside You can be a whitewashed tomb. You can look beautiful. But God can say, you're dead. Because what I care about is in your heart. Is this easy to do, by the way? No. It's not for me. Which is why we probably are led to be totally dependent upon God. And then we mourn. And then we entrust ourselves to the Lord. J.I. Packer, a Christian theologian, says that holiness, very connected with righteousness, holiness starts inside a person. That's different than behavior modification. That's totally on the outside. Holiness starts inside a person with the right purpose that seeks to express itself in right performance. So does performance matter? Of course it does. But it starts inside. It's a matter not of just the motions I go through, but the motives that prompt me to go through them. He says, a holy person's motivating aim, desire, longing, aspiration, goal, and drive is to please God, to be wholeheartedly devoted by what one does and by what one avoids doing. I think Jesus sums this up in our final passage today. Jesus sums this up again in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, verse 19 through 21. Here, Jesus, this is kind of a hinge verse that connects the first half of chapter 6 with the second half of chapter 6. And he says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. And that what it, that's what it means to flourish like the nations, to flourish like everyone else, is to store up treasures for yourself on earth. And that could be material possessions, that can be honor from people, that can be all sorts of things. Where is your treasure? Are you storing it up on earth? Because if you are, then moths and vermin destroy it, and thieves break in and steal it. And it ultimately leads on a path that is empty. So don't do that. Don't seek to be like the Israelites, to flourish like the nations. But instead, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. And to store up for yourselves treasures in heaven is to be dedicated wholeheartedly to the Lord. And verse 21, most important. For where your treasure is, there your what? 
heart will be also. That's the question this morning. Where is your heart? Does your heart beat, ache, and crave wholehearted devotion to the Lord? Or are you seeking to flourish like the nations? Because when we seek wholeheartedly to be devoted to God, we receive a flourishing life, but only because what we ache and long for and what motivates and drives us, our passion from the core of our soul is to be devoted to Him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You that You call us not just to an outward performance that is skin deep, but that You call us to wholehearted devotion and that by Your Spirit You enable us in partnership with You to walk down a path of heart transformation, the path of righteousness, the straight and narrow path. And Lord, I pray for anyone that's wandered off that path here today, that your Holy Spirit would convict and invite to return again, to trust completely in you, and to seek wholehearted devotion to you above all else. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.